All right, so like I said, we're going to pick up in verse 5. If you are visiting with this or uh, you're looking for material, we don't have a workbook that we're working through with this. We've just got going through the text, got the PowerPoint. I do have some questions up here. <coughs> Those questions are also posted online. If you want to go to our website, 84church.com, click on Bible class material, auditorium Sunday morning, you'll see Jude, click on Jude. And there's two sets of questions, one uh, for verses uh, 1 through 5 and then 12 through 25. And we will be <clears throat> picking up with verse 5 through 11 today going through those questions. So as we uh, started last time, um, just kind of got through the first four verses of Jude, went through a little bit of an introduction. Just look at the salutation remarks that are there. But real quickly, Jude gets into the reason for his writing the letter, and that is to contend earnestly for the faith. It is certainly the theme of the letter that you contend earnestly for the faith, that you fight for the faith. And why is that? Kind of gets into this in verse 4, but why, could, why do we need to contend earnestly for the faith? What is there that, that, that's out there? The of okay, very good. So we have the promise of heaven, so we want to contend earnestly because we want to get there. And what's out there that might keep us from that? Sin. And who do we have out that is slipping in, sneaking in? Ungodly men, right? These false teachers. We talked about it last time. This is real similar to the letter that we went through previous to this in 2 Peter. Um, you go through 2 Peter versus, uh, chapters, uh, chapter 2 in particular, pointing out the false teachers that are there and the danger that is there. And so these men have come in sneakily, and they're, they, they're those who uh, turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny uh, the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Then that brings us up to verse 5. So he tells them, hey, I, I wrote to you uh, because we have this common salvation. We have this hope of heaven. You need to contend earnestly for the faith. You need to be willing and ready to stand and to fight for the faith, that being the objective fixed standard of faith. Like I said, that kind of brings us over to verse 5. So before we do answer question 3, let's read 5 through... Um, Let's actually just read 5 through 7, and then we'll go from there. Somebody want to read verses 5 through 7 for me? Bo? I want to remind you that you once knew this, but the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he had reserved an everlasting chain under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. All right, very good. So, question number three here, <clears throat> really looking at verses five through seven, what did Jude want to remind them? What did Jude want to remind them? That's right. But I want to remind you, going back to, hey, <clears throat> look at the stories in the past. Look at the Old Testament. Look what was there. It was reminding them as those that rebelled against God, how did that work out for them, for lack of a better way of putting it? How, well, what was there in? Yes. Yeah. Wasn't good, right? Nope. nope. <laughs> That's right. And he's talking about the fact that you need to contend earnestly for the faith. And one of the reasons why you need to contend earnestly for the faith is because there's these false teachers, these ungodly men that have come in. And they're teaching their false doctrine, and as we saw in 2 Peter, they're going to be those that uh, adhere and listen to that false doctrine, and they get drug away into that. And he says, I want to remind you, though you once knew this, this is something that, that you've been taught before, but I'm going to, once again, that idea of call to remembrance, bring to the forefront of your mind, this is why you're contending for the faith, because those who go against God, there's a punishment for them. There is destruction for them. It's not good. You don't want to do it. So therefore, what do we need to do? Well, we need to contend earnestly for the faith. And like was said, there are various examples that are used there. Examples of those who were destroyed for their rebellion. It's really what we see. It starts with the children of Israel. Although God saved the people out of Egyptian bondage, he destroyed those who did not believe. Now, that could be applied to these individuals for, uh, for sure, right? Writing to Christians. 
had been saved, been baptized. But although they had been saved and, and, and been ba or were baptized and, and were in a right state with God, what could they very easily start to do? Does that mean that they're saved forever? Once saved, always saved. No, right? That's one of the things that's being pointed out here. Look, even the children of Israel, they, they, they were saved out of Egyptian bondage, but then they were destroyed. Why? Because they did not believe. And remember that idea of belief and biblical belief. Whenever we define what believe or belief means in the Bible, what does that mean? Is it just believe that he is? Obedience, right? Belief and obedience are connected with one another. That's what biblical belief is. Biblical belief is, yes, I believe that he is, but that's to the point of being obedient to him. And so they were disobedient. That's what Hebrews 3 points out about the children of Israel. And so although God saved these people out of Egyptian bondage, he destroyed those who did not believe God. In other words, who were disobedient to God, who rebelled against God. So you don't want to do that. Remember that. Contend earnestly for the faith. He brings up the angels. God has reserved in an everlasting change under darkness the angels who left their abode or role. There's not a whole lot that we can <coughs> say uh, about angels because it's not like there's just a ton revealed. There's a little bit. But evidently, from what's being pointed out by Jude, there were angels. We know angels are created, right? Angels are there. And we know with angels, what, uh, that, that according to this, they were put in specific roles Positions or abodes. And what did these do? What did these angels do? They left those. That's right. They left those abodes, right? In other words, God put them in a position, an abode, and a role right there. And what did they do? Well, they rebelled against where God had put them. Again, it's that idea of those who rebel against God, doesn't matter if it's the children of Israel, the chosen children of Israel, or the angels. Or Sodom and Gomorrah set forth as an example of those who suffered the vengeance of eternal fire. For what? For sexual morality and homosexuality. In other words, even those that are just of the world that rebel against God, what is reserved for them? Destruction. It doesn't matter where you are. Those who rebel against God, it's not good for them. And he said, again, going back to verse 5, says, I want to remind you of this. I want to remind you of this. Why? So you will contend earnestly for the faith. You make that application to us. There's a reason why we contend earnestly for the faith. There's a reason why we take doctrinal stands and why whenever we see doctrinal error, you don't just let it slip. Because those who rebel against God and those who follow in that rebellion, as we'll get to in a minute, whenever we start seeing some of the other examples listed in verse 11, what's going to happen? Destruction. Okay? So... The example of those who were destroyed for their rebellion, he wants to bring to their mind to call to remembrance so they'll contend earnestly for the faith. So they got anything on five through seven? Aaron? I think that this is a great reminder for us to look at what happens when we change truth knowingly or unknowingly. What occurs when one changes truth? It reminds me of Galatians <coughs> chapter, chapter four, uh, particularly verses eight. And the idea there, as it is with Jude, of what happens. You have these freedoms and liberties only found in God and Jesus Christ. And when you change the truth, the destruction that, that then happens. So it says in verse 8 of Galatians chapter 4, Formerly when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not God. But now that you know God, or rather known by God, how is that you're turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved? by them all over again? In other words, if you don't stay with truth, then look at the horrible life that you're going to live. Verse 10, you're observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. And so that desire, that need for us to not change truth. That's right. Truth is something that, that isn't going to be changed. It's something that's established by God, and we have to submit to it. Whenever we don't, there is obvious uh, issues uh, for us, right? Destruction is going to happen. And again, being uh, that, that idea of being in bondage, you know, going back to that, is that something that we really want? And uh, we know that whenever we do, that there is no peace at that point because you're separated from God once again. So not changing it, staying the course, contending, fighting the fight. doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. It's a whole lot better to fight that fight and contend for that faith and pass away knowing that you contended for that faith and having that peace. 
assurance of heaven than not. Go ahead, Larry. Yeah, that's right. It's definitely something that's pointed out as a sin. You see it with Sodom and Gomorrah. You see it in 1 Corinthians 6 and in other areas that those who practice such are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And so it's a, it's a choice that is made, and it's one that uh, goes against the faith. And so we understand that, we recognize that, and we see the need to stand in the fight. Anybody else got anything? DJ? Also, you know, whether you are his people, whether you are not his people, or even if you're an angel. I mean, you know, there's the differences between those three of saying, no matter where you are in life, if you are doing this, you will be punished. Yeah, that's right. Doesn't matter who you are or where you are, you got to be those who are obedient to God, those who do not rebel against God. And that's one of the things that he's really. Uh, encouraging them to do. Contend and fight for the faith. Don't go against it. Okay? So, and it doesn't matter where you are in society. And so he brings this to their remembrance because this is what happens whenever those go down the path of error. And certainly he's going to bring up these dreamers. Okay? And what he means by that is the false teachers. So let's look at verses 8 through 10. Somebody want to read that for me? Let's say 2 10. Go ahead, Art. Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, <coughs> they corrupt themselves. Okay, can you read 11 for me too? I'm sorry. Okay, very good. So, hey, this destruction happened to these. And so how are these dreamers, pointing towards the false teachers, how are these like the examples given in verses 5 through 7? How are the false teachers like the examples that we see? 5 through 7. That's right. Uh, they followed in the same path that these did in their corruption and rebelling against God. And, you know, they made the choice and are making the choice to do so. Like we saw at the end of Second Peter, taking and twisting scripture to their own destruction. Uh, those types of things. They are making the choice to go down this path. And so these dreamers, these false teachers are like these. They are those who defile the flesh who reject authority, speak evil of dignitaries. We see that false teachers have no regard for authority. They follow the flesh. They're living in sin. We talked last time about uh, one of the prominent or prevalent false teachings of the day was the Gnostic doctrine. I'm not saying it's 100% for sure what Jude is dealing with, but it would certainly apply to those who continue to live a life of sin and think that they are okay, think that they are this higher learned individual that spirit and soul is separate from the physical body, and while I can continue to sin physically, my soul is okay. And they would claim to have this, and one of the things that Jude's point out is, these are those who are defiling the flesh and living in sin. And First John deals with that issue uh, of one continuing to live in sin. Um, these reject authority. Again, that goes right along with what uh, these uh, examples did in 5 through 7, right? Rejection of the authority of God. 
they don't, the angels, they didn't stay in their abode. The children of Israel were disobedient to God. Sodom and Gomorrah just lived completely, you know, immorally, whatever they wanted to. So there's a complete rebellion against God. You see, speaking evil of dignitaries, uh, you know, a lot of people will say that this really points to speaking evil of celestial beings because what's followed up is Michael the archangel did not bring a reviling accusation against the devil. Okay, these are those that speak evil even uh, of uh, dignitaries. Celestial beings, this is something that Michael the Archangel, he didn't do. He didn't bring a reviling action against the devil. What did he do? What, what, what was his response in that case? We don't really have a whole lot except for what is said here, but what is said? He dared not. Okay, he dared not. And then he says, but said, the Lord rebuke you, right? Wasn't something that was for him to do in that case. Where did he leave it? God's hands, right? He didn't speak out of turn. He stayed in his position where he should have stayed. Those, meaning the false uh, teachers, the dreamers, they are not doing that. Neither did those who we saw in verses 5 through 7. It goes on to say, and this is what Matt was pointing out, <coughs> these speak evil of what they do not know. Whatever they do know, naturally, they speak, uh, whatever they do know, naturally, like brute beasts and these things, they corrupt themselves. They speak evil against things in which they do not understand. Um, and whatever they do know, whatever they know, naturally, like brute beasts and these things, they have to corrupt themselves. They're out to fulfill their own desires. Like brute beasts of the field, what are they out to do? Are they out to be obedient to God, to listen to him, to listen to command and authority? No, they're out for themselves and fulfilling their own desires. That's what we see being pointed to here. And whenever we notice the fact that these are those that uh, are disobedient to God and his authority. They're just out living for themselves. What's going to be uh, come up as a result of that sin is going to be prevalent in their life. It goes back to the point that they have defiled the flesh. And it goes on in verse 11. They have gone in the way of Cain, run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit, perish in the rebellion of Korah. Some examples that they are likened to, that they are pointed to. They didn't offer a sacrifice by faith. They looked for gain and not God's will, and then they rebelled against God. That's what we see these doing, okay? You, you see the language, and I'm going to get into this more here in a minute whenever we actually go through 12 through 13. But one of the things I want to point out real quickly, why the, the, the harsh language against these? Well, we know that part of it is destruction comes with their teaching, so you can't follow them, and so they need to be spoken out against. But the language is so harsh and so uh, vivid imagery of going back to the Old Testament and saying, this is what these false teachers are like. Why? Well, remember, false teachers, how do they teach? Do they seem like something that's that bad? Do they seem like that's something that's just going to leave you down the path of destruction and, and have you all wrapped up in, in all this terrible thing, all the terrible things in life? No. That's not what false teachers do. If false teachers proclaim that, they, you wouldn't follow them. I mean, they'd be teaching something, and it would be false, but they wouldn't be something that you'd be concerned with because you'd completely uh, ignore what they had to say. But what they're doing is they're presenting things, remember, with great swelling words. It's something else that's going to be said here. They're presenting things with great swelling words, and they're presenting things in a way in which people take a liking to and, and latch on to. But one of the things that Judah's reminding them is this. I want to remind you of this. You go down this path that goes away from God, and this is what it is like. Some of the most terrible examples that you can come up with in the Old Testament are those who have rebelled against God and the destruction that happened as a result of it. This is where you would be going if you follow these teachers. So be reminded of that and don't follow them. And you need to bring this to your memory and contend earnestly for the faith. Anybody got anything to add to that? All right, let's read 12 through 16. <coughs> Want to read 12 through 16? DJ? These are spots in your love feast. While they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are a cloud without water, carried about by the wind. Like autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. Grazing waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars on them as a dirt, blackness of darkness forever. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, 
Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in their ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. These are, these are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lust, and, the, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which are spoken before by the apostles of, the, of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, very good. So we uh, go into what I had kind of as the next lesson, but starting in Jude, verse 12, question 1 for this set of questioning, 12 through 25. What are the false teachers likened to? What does this tell us about them and their teaching in 12 and 13? So what, what do we see false teachers compared to? What are they likened to? Clouds without water. Okay, very good. Clouds without water. We talked about that last time. It's real similar language that we see in 2 Peter, right? I had an idea of clouds without water. We'll come back to that in a minute. What else? Okay, fruitless trees. Very good. Jason? Uh, hidden reef. Say that again? A hidden reef. Hidden reef. Okay, very good. Anybody got anything else? All right. Talked about the fact that these are spots, right? That they are shepherds that serve themselves. Uh, that we see this idea of, uh, like Jason was saying, hidden reef. So, we, we kind of have all these ideas come up, okay? So what are these false teachers like in two? Well, there are spots among you, shepherds feeding themselves. In other words, they're self-serving, right? They're feeding themselves. Are they really necessarily, what they're teaching and what they're doing, is it going to be something that benefits you? Maybe, uh, as far as their intent. But at the end of the day, really, what are they looking for? Serving themselves, right? You might see this definitely in the denominational world, but unfortunately, we even see this from time to time within um, uh, churches. Those that won't teach the full word of God. Those that won't give the full word of God, what do they give? What the people want to hear, right? You go over to 2 Timothy 4, the idea of they heap up for themselves teachers. Well, that means that there are teachers that are going to do what? Teach what they want to hear. Teach what they want to hear. Okay? So you got those that will teach what they want to hear. Not only give them what they want to hear. Not give them the full word. And as a result of that, is there some benefit for the teacher to not teaching the full word? In, in their mind, right? They're trying to gain followers, trying to gain attention, maybe, you know, keep everything okay, not ruffle any feathers here or there, gain some popularity, might be financially, they, they might gain some stuff, but we kind of see that. And that's some of the idea that we see, shepherds that serve themselves. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I just kind of expound on, a little bit on what Jason was saying, was that, that word spots there is translated into a hidden reef, meaning it's going to crash your ship. Right. That's a, that's a real good point. I appreciate you bringing that out. I mean, you, you have that idea of these spots that are there. And, and uh, you know, it goes back to the beginning. They kind of come in in a manner and a way in which you don't recognize them, but they're there. And what do they eventually do? They bring about destruction. We see that they're after themselves uh, a lot of times as far as feeding themselves. They're clouds without water carried by the wind. We talked about that when we were in Second Peter. Those that claim to bring hope but bring none. Uh, the message that they have might be a message that seems to be one that's hopeful, just like a cloud coming in might be something that is hopeful for a farmer that is perhaps will get the needed rain, but there is no rain in them. 
that does not actually come to fruition. It's the same thing here. The message that might seem to have hope, they claim to bring it, but there is none in the end. Uh, in the end. Late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. Uh, they are those who are unprofitable because they do not uh, bear, uh, because they do not bear no fruit of righteousness, because they do not bear fruit of righteousness. X that out right there. They do not bear fruit of righteousness. So, and that's what David was talking about earlier. They, they, they bear no fruit. You can see that uh, in them whenever you really weed through some of what's there. And we continue on. They're wa raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame. They bring about destruction like a wave leaving filth on a seashore, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness. You see them for a time, but they ultimately disappear. Again, the vivid imagery that's here to describe what these are like, why? Well, because on the surface, so many think that they're okay and there's nothing wrong with them. <clears throat> and there's nothing wrong with their teaching. But you need to have your eyes open to how dangerous they are and how dangerous their teaching is and how influential they are so that you will actually contend for the faith. You will stand against it. We need to make sure that, that we're doing that. And that's, that's why we're reminded over and over and over again about uh, false teaching, about doctrinal error that's out there, and to fight against it because if somebody believes it and goes down that path, it brings about destruction. It's not something that can be tolerated and uh, everybody just be okay. Going on to verse uh, 14, and that kind of sums it up. False teachers have no benefit or self-serving and bring about destruction. Question number two, this is 14 through 16. Who will God execute judgment on? Who will he convict? And what will convict them? So he talks about this is what these are like. These are what the false teachers are like, right? He talks about the destruction that they bring and, and really what's there. On the surface, it might look okay, but they're not. This is vivid imagery that, that, that's painted of what they're really like and what's going to happen to them in the end. Destruction. Destruction. And JP, to go back to that, uh -huh. when you look at the example of verse 11, at the end there it brings up core, right? Uh -huh. And this imagery, if you look back at number 16, is so very similar to the story of core that he just talked about in verse 11. You know, re rebellion against God, you know, and, and it wasn't really, it, it was both, right? We, we do this and we see this even in the church and we need to be careful about this, is that we may say something against, well, the preacher's not preaching truth, but we find out he's preaching truth and so then we're the ones that are wrong, right? And so if we go up against that truth, then we're wrong. That's exactly what happens with Corey. It goes up against Moses and Aaron, and he's wrong. So God then has Moses and Aaron bring, bring him up, the 250. They're gone. They're dead. Destruction. Then these people go, why did you do this? Why are they gone? Why did they kill? And then 16, you know, like 14,000 or something, 14, 15, I can't remember which one number, you know, then are, are, are killed. Complete destruction. And so there's no hope. When one is not in truth, no matter how you try to slant it, no matter how you try to twist it, no matter how you try to shape it, if it's not true, destruction will occur. It's a, in this life, in judgment. That's a good point. I appreciate you bringing it out because a lot of times whenever we're talking about it with false teachers, you know, we are thinking, okay, the ones that are here, right, or up there, or whatever, preaching, maybe it's in services or Bible class or whatever, right? And, uh, and really, there's no distinction between teaching and preaching. It's all the same thing uh, scripturally uh, as far as you're proclaiming God's word. So we think of one, though, that's up front doing that. And that's the one that this is accusing. Well, no doubt those who are out front doing it need to be dealt with. But it's, it can be anybody that's sitting anywhere in the crowd, any, anywhere that is spreading false doctrine or false error. That's not abiding in that doctrine of Christ. That is one who is a false teacher. And so... We all need to be careful of it to make sure that we're like, well, I'm not the teacher up front, you know, so this really just applies to those. You know, if you're one that's going to be spreading that doctrinal error and you're going to be one that's not abiding in the truth, you're one that's rebelling against God. And we need to understand that. I appreciate that point. Um, okay, so I forgot where we left off, but we were here somewhere on this question. Uh, who will 
convict them one minute or first life? Okay, thank you. God will convict all. Okay, very good. Very good. So judgment is going to come, verse uh, 15, uh, execute judgment on all, to convict all who what? All who what? <coughs> what will convict them? Ungodliness, right? And pay attention to what's said there. And it goes on. It talks about any prophesied about the judgment to come and the judgment false teachers like these would face. Those convicted are what? Right? The, 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 those that are convicted, the, those who are going to have this judgment to rebel against God, these are ungodly. Ungodly, ungodly, ungodly. It says it four different times, right? The ungodly among them, their deeds are ungodly. They have committed them in an ungodly way. The ungodly sinners who have spoken harsh things against them. Um, you know, something that, that uh, we understand when we're studying scripture is anytime we see that repetitive nature of this word over and over and over again, there's an emphasis being placed on something, right? And clearly what's being placed, the ones that are convicted, the ones that uh, are going to be destroyed are those who are ungodly. But one of the things that I want to point out is this. A lot of times we think of ungodly because we say, oh, that's just ungodly and ungodliness and all this and that. Well, I want you to understand something about ungodly that I have to remind myself of from time to time, and that's this. The word ungodly that we see here means irreverent, impious, without reverence for God. Vine says it's not merely irreligious, but acting in contravention of God's demands. Arden Gingrich say that this word means violating norms for a proper relation to deity. In other words, ungodly is not limited to those who are completely immoral and the scum of society. Ungodly are those who oppose God's words, who rebel against God in any way. I don't care if it's lying or if it's being a murderer. It doesn't matter. An ungodly individual is an individual that goes against God, so we can't take this and say that this only applies to that group of people. Ungodly, ungodly, ungodly. He says it four different times in this passage. And what's being pointed out is those who rebel against God on any level, and that goes back to Aaron's point, on any level of truth, those are the individuals who are going to be condemned and that rebel against God. We need to make sure that we're not like that. Okay, Scott, and I thought I saw one other hand go up, but Scott, you first. If you're in a car, a boat, or an airplane, and you're just a little bit off, you end up a way, way off. Right. It's even worse in Scripture. If you're just a little bit off on something, you're way off. And like mentioned last week, typically uh, – People that start getting just a little bit off, it's they come across and feel like they're enlightened. You know, they've been enlightened and they've believed this all their life, and now they have been enlightened and they believe just just one little thing. And well, usually one little thing, as you're going along in life, turns into two little things, and then three little things, and they're not little things. You know, you end up way off course. That's right. You know, another uh, thought that I've heard along those lines is this idea that, well, as long as they don't teach that, it's okay. If you have a doctrinal error in your thought process, there is absolutely no way you can keep that hidden from your teaching. In some manner, way, shape, or form, it is going to come up somewhere in your teaching because everything is linked together. We hold fast the pattern of sound words. It's all connected. If you're off doctrinally somewhere, it's going to make something else off because you've taken scripture and you've twisted this, which means now what am I going to have to do with this scripture? Well, I either got to change my error or I still believe it, and that means I then twist this over here, and it continues to compound. There's no way for one to believe a doctrinal error and it not ever get brought up in any other situation. And we need to understand that, and I think that goes along with your point. It eventually starts to compound off one another. David? Uh, 
church, there is a failure to reverence the full authority of God there. We can sugarcoat it any way you want. There's a failure to, to submit to that reverence to God that is ungodly. That's a, that's a real good point. I think bringing it back, that's why one of the reasons why he emphasizes it over and over again, right? These false teachers, they might seem like they're okay, but hey, let me paint the picture for you of what's really there. They are ungodly, they are ungodly, they are ungodly, they are ungodly. Don't think that that's just reserved for these. Even the false teacher there is ungodly if they are teaching something other than the doctrine of Christ. All right, I appreciate